This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. And it, can you turn straight to chapter 16, which is page 105? It's handed up control accounts. And it's actually something you'll see makes rather nice little questions. Which, in principle, are very easy. Um, you'll have to be patient with me, obviously, but uh, what always they have a few questions on is effectively asking you to write up a control account. I've said receivables, ledger control is total receivables, payables, ledger control, total payables. Well, they might give you some information. They might tell you, oh, the sales on credit were this much. The cash received was this much. And effectively ask you to write up the receivables account. All right? Now, again, because you're ticking boxes, what in fact do they do? They give you an account with some mistakes in it. And ask you effectively to correct it. However, there are three special entries that could affect receivables or payables, which we've not yet mentioned. Uh, there are three of them. Two of them, I think, are very easy indeed. One's a bit of terminology. But let me explain what I mean. Three little entries which I need to go through. How we deal with, in fact, uh, discounts returns, and something called contras. But let me show you three little entries. I'll say, I think two of them are very obvious indeed, but let's make sure. And then I'll show you how they can ask questions. Um, if you turn straight, I'm not going to read all that to you. If you turn straight to page 106, let me explain what I'm talking about. Let's see if we can start out the entry. And the first one, something we haven't had in an example so far, is returns. And I'll explain with example. If you look there, it says, suppose we sell goods on credit to Mr. X for 500. What's the double entry, please, when you sell goods on credit? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> it's too early in the morning. When you sell on credit, we debit receivables. What was it, 500? You credit sales. You all agree? All right, with books of prime entry, in practice... You'd list it first, and then you'd debit credit with the total. But whatever happens, ultimately, when you sell on credit, you debit receivables, you credit sales. Nothing new, you all agree. However, something we've not had so far, but you'd all accept, that happens in real life, a week later, Mr. X returns half the goods. I've said we accept it, you know, we've agreed. We'll let him return the goods, he doesn't need them. And of course, if he's returned the goods, he no longer owes us the full amount. What, do what double entry do you think will be needed if Mr. X returns half those goods? Have a guess, somebody. Receivable? Yeah, surely. Sorry, I'm stopping you deliberately. Surely, if, if, if you bought goods from me and you owe me 500, if I let you return half of them, I think clearly you don't owe me as much. You'll credit receivables, 250 returned half of them. Sensible? And where do you think we'll debit? Well, in fact, you have the choice. 
Some come out, you'll certainly credit receivables. I think obviously now only owes us for the remainder. You could either debit sales or what often happens, especially if this happens quite regularly, maybe you'll open up a new account called returns. Credit receivables, debit returns. However, the reason it doesn't matter is that when you came to do your income statement, the income statement, if you have kept two separate accounts, on your income statement, you would show sales less returns. So there's no rule, it doesn't matter at all. You can either debit sales and say net sales 250, fine. Or, if you prefer in real life, have a separate account, but then we put the two together. Clear? Now that I'm not desperately worried about. All I'm worried about is this. That I hope it's common sense to everybody. If ever a customer returns goods, they owe you less money. You would credit receivables. Clear? Simple as that. It's just, as I said, we hadn't had one before. I need to check these th three special things. But is everybody happy about the effect of a return? When you sell on credit, debit receivables. If they return goods, credit receivables. Okay. All right, next one. The next thing that can happen, which we've not particularly dealt with, is discounts. Now, you may remember me mentioning last time, but I must mention again, there are two reasons why you might give your customers a discount. One reason is because they're a big customer. You know, you're a big customer, and so I always give you a 10% discount. Agreed? We call that a trade discount. So, a trade discount is a discount for a big customer. And listen to me carefully here, but for that one there's absolutely no problem. Because if I'm selling something to you, well I'll write it down, suppose I sell something the normal price is 100. But I tell you, you're a big customer. There's a trade discount of 10%. Well, if I told you you'll get a discount of 10%, I'd only actually charge you. Would you agree, 90 and your invoice. The invoice will be for $90. And as normal, if I invoice you $90, we'll debit receivables, we'll credit sales. Absolutely no problem. No tricks. We're all happy there, I hope. However, where there is a tiny problem is the other reason for giving a discount. The other reason you might give people a discount, maybe less common here, but this is the one for the exam, is if you offer people a discount, if they pay quickly, we call it a cash discount.
And be careful, although we call it a cash discount, it doesn't mean they have to pay cash. You know, you might, you, sorry, my customers might usually take one month to pay. I might tell you, if you pay me in two weeks, then I'll give you a discount. It's a discount for paying early. Again, I hope that makes sense to everybody. I mean, obviously, any business wants to um, get people to pay quickly. The faster they pay, the better. Well, one way of trying to get them to pay quickly is not to force them, but to say, if you pay quick, then you can pay less, you can have a discount. All right? But it's your choice. If you still take a month to pay me, you'll pay the full amount... If you pay early, then you'll pay less. We clear? Well, that needs a tiny bit more thought. Look at the example here. Suppose we sell goods for a thousand on credit to Mr. Y. And we offer him a 5% discount if he pays us within a month. Now, the problem we've got is that when I send the invoice, I don't know whether he'll pay early or not. Would you agree? If he takes more than a month, he'll have to pay the full thousand. If he pays in a month, he'll pay less. But I say again, when I send the invoice, I've no idea whether he'll pay quickly or he won't. And so what we do is this. When it's a cash discount, we send an invoice for a thousand. We enter the full amount. You debit receivables. You credit sales. I'm sorry, I'm not writing the words in. I don't think I need. But that's the amount on the invoice. That's how much we enter. If he takes longer than a month, no problem. Because, of course, if he takes longer than a month, he'll have to pay me the thousand. Debit cash credit receivables finished. Hello. However, it turns out in this question that he does pay us within a month. And therefore, he pays 5% less, he pays 9 to 50. Okay? Well, tell me, what's the double entry, please, when we receive the 950? Hello, what's the double entry when a customer pays us cash? Debit cash. Thank you. Yeah, no tricks. When we get the money, debit cash, credit receivables... You're with me here. But clearly, we can't leave it like that. If we just leave it like that, we have him still owing us 50. And yet, of course, he doesn't owe us the 50. We were letting him pay less because he paid early. All right? And so, surely, I say again, we can't leave it like that. Surely, we do need to sort that out. You all agree he doesn't actually owe us anything at all? What entry do we need in receivables, please, to remove the balance? Credit. Thank you. Is Lee here the only person awake here? When, we've, uh, when he pays us and we realise he's taken a discount... We have to credit receivables, surely, because the balance, the balance is zero, he owes us nothing. Where's the double entry going to go, though? Surely, 
It's costing us fifty dollars. This discount we're giving him. We open up a new account to record the cost. We credit receivables. We debit discounts with fifty. It's easy. But see the see why we need to do this. When you send the invoice, you must enter the full amount because you don't know whether you'll pay early or not. When he pays us, if he has paid early and had the discount, then we need to make sure that we clear the balance. Credit receivables, he doesn't owe anything. Debit the expense. Sensible? And although I'm only really worried for the exam about the receivables account, tell me, where do you think this discounts will appear when I do my accounts? You know, sales appears in the income statement. Oh, what's going to happen to discounts? Surely it's an expense. It'll simply be an expense in the income statement. Now, I'm less worried because I say what, what you'll be tested on is the receivables account. But you've credited sales with the sales. If he has had a cash discount, it's an expense like any expense. In expenses, rent, telephone, electricity, discounts of 50. Okay? So, I don't know. Does that make sense? Uh, you'll see in a minute, of course, in real life, you've got total receivables where you're recording all your sales on credit, all the cash received. But whenever you find a customer's had a discount like this, we're going to have to enter it, credit, discount, uh, credit receivables, they don't owe us the full amount, debit the expense. Okay. Uh, one tiny bit of terminology. Here, we're giving a discount to a customer. You all agree, it's costing us money, it's an expense. Equally, you could have the case where suppliers give us a discount. And I don't think I need to enter it, but if we get a discount, surely it's like a bit of income. Would you agree? Well, the terminology, I hope, is no problem, but make sure. If you give a discount to customers, we call it a discount allowed. So, discount allowed, we give a discount to customers... And it's an expense. If it's the other way, and a supplier gives us a discount, so we pay less, we call it a discount received. So, discount received... We get a discount from suppliers. And I'm sure you can accept. Since we are getting, we are benefiting, um, it would be exactly the same as before, the other way around. It would be income. All right. So we're nearly there, but this is what I meant earlier. Two extra entries that may be required, returns and discounts, which I hope are sensible enough, but which we haven't specifically had earlier. Okay? 
All right, one more. And the last one, I think it's easy enough, but it's just a little bit less obvious. Um, you can see for yourself, it's called a contra-entry. And let me explain it with the example. We sell goods on credit to Mr. Said for 800. What's the double entry when you sell goods on credit? <sighs> Sorry, I know it's a bit tricky this morning, but um, if you sell goods on credit, you'll debit receivables. How much was it? 800? Your credit sales. That's all we ever do. This is just one sale, obviously, with thousands of sales. In real life, you'd list it in your receivables, uh, receivables journal. And then, of course, you'll put the total sales, debit receivables, credit sales. You all agree? Carry on, though. Z happens to be a supplier, and we buy goods from him for a thousand. Well, no problem. When you buy goods on credit, what's the double entry? Nobody's going to tell me, so I'll do it. When you buy goods on credit, you credit payables, and you debit purchases. Again, you all agree, I hope. That's all we ever do. Again, in practice, you've got these different bookkeepers. Somebody's recording all the sales on credit, 800 in total, debit receivables, credit sales. Somebody else is recording all the purchases on credit. And in total, de uh, credit payables, debit purchases. Normally, that's the end of it. And on your balance sheet, receivables, obviously in total, but here 800, payables, 1,000. However, here, it doesn't happen often, but it can happen. This is the same person. Mr. Z owes us 800, we owe him 1,000. And it just might happen, as it says here, that we speak to Mr. Z on the phone and say, well, instead of us having to pay you a thousand and you pay us eight hundred, why don't we just sort out, I'll pay you the difference? Sensible? You know, you don't have to. If he pays us the full eight hundred, no problem. Debit, cash, credit, 800. Lovely. And we pay him the full 1,000. Credit, cash, debit, payables, 1,000. But you'd all agree. We might decide, and it says here, we agree with Mr. Z that instead of him paying us and us paying him, we simply pay him the net 200. You're all with me? Fine. What's the double entry, please? When you pay a supplier, 200. Come on, somebody tell me. You pay a supplier, 200. What's the double entry when you pay money to a supplier? Credit cash. Debit. Debit. Payables. That's all we ever do. When you pay a supplier, credit cash, debit payables. That's all we ever do. In real life, it would have been listed in your payments book. Then we'd do it in total in payables. But that's all we're not going to change. Except, of course, we can't leave it like that. If we leave it like that, the danger is 
somebody will end up chasing him to pay us 800 and he doesn't owe us money. An even bigger danger, given we've lots of separate bookkeepers, is that we end up paying him 800 when, of course, we don't owe him any money. You agree? And so, surely, if we've agreed this on the telephone, oh, clearly, he doesn't owe us, we don't owe him. We need to clear those balances. What entry do I need in receivables to remove the 800? Credit, Credit receivables. And where do you think the debit would be? Payables. Payables. Surely, when it, it may not happen often, but if this happens, when we agree to cancel what he owes us with what we owe him, to do it, we need to credit receivables and debit payables. Surely. Is that sensible, everybody? Now, again, it doesn't actually happen that often in real life, you know. Uh, La Telecom, I invoice La Telecom because they send lots of people on courses. So, you know, they're receivable, they owe me money. Equally, I use them for telephone, they send me invoices and I owe them. You agree? Well, no problem. I pay them in full, they pay me in full. We don't have a telephone call and I'll say, <laughs> pay me a bit less because of the telephone bill. But there clearly can be cases when this happens. He owes us, we owe him. Let's just pay the difference. All right? Well, that entry there is actually quite unusual. It's the first entry you've seen where there wasn't actually a transaction. In a sense, it was a phone call. That entry was just a bookkeeping entry to put things right. You understand me? And it doesn't matter, but where it's a pure bookkeeping entry like that, we call it a contra-entry. In F3, it's the only one you'll ever see. But a contra-entry, it's always this situation where you're, I think you're happy with the expression, you're cancelling a receivable and cancelling a payable. And the entry is always, always the same. If ever you see mention of a contra-entry, you always debit payables. It will reduce the amount we owe. You always credit receivables. It reduces the amount they owe us. All right? Uh, some people... I know you haven't had much time to think. And as a result, some people say, oh, but what happens if it was the other way around, you know? What happens if he owed us more than we owe him? Doesn't make any difference. Just look at this. You don't need to write this. You don't need. But suppose, suppose we invoice him with 2,000. You debit receivables with 2,000. Agreed? Suppose we owe him... 1,500. You credit payables, 1,500. Agreed? This time, surely, if we make the agreement, instead of me paying him and him paying us, he pays us the difference. Still with me? Well, what happens when a customer pays? Whenever a customer pays us money, Debit cash, credit receivables. 
But again, like before, you can't leave it like that. He doesn't owe us the, the balance. We don't owe him. How do you remove it? Always credit receivables, debit payables. Always you're cancelling what he owes us. You're cancelling what he, we owe him. Okay? Contra. Incidentally, not for the exam, not for the exam. But what you see in real life often, particularly when it's by hand, instead of writing contra, they put C with a line through it. Um, it's shorthand for contra. I say you'll never see that in an exam, they can't type it. But if in real life you ever see a C with a line through it, it's the shorthand for a contra entry.